Yeah, I'm sorry. As I play this song, um, as I said, focus on who God really is, who Jesus, they're all one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all worthy. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to give us the blessed hope of eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for the great sacrifice that you made on Calvary's cross. You didn't throw us away as garbage when our parents sinned, but you devised a plan to save us. We are eternally grateful. May you accept words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. The Lord, you are our strength. You are our redeemer. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. And the music, beautiful. Thank you. It encourages us to sing. I wanted to sing. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. So this morning, uh, the title of my message is The Conflict is Here. It's not somewhere far off. It's right here. You see, our father, Adam, was instructed by God that he could eat from every tree except one. Do you know, when you tell your kids don't walk in the water, what do they do? Don't. Don't get your nice white sneakers in the mud. What do they do first thing? They jump in the mud. And so I'm teasing my son. I said, you're going to get payback. Because when he, he was growing up, he was in everything. I was a little boy is in everything. So you're right, Ron. You, just, you look just like your dad. And you act like him in a, in a lot of ways. But you got some of Gloria mixed in there. And so our parent, Adam, 
according to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the Lord God commanded, this was a mandate, that every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt do what? Wow. And because it didn't happen right away, they didn't believe God. And so Adam exercised free will inherent in love. If you love somebody, you can't force them to love you back. It has to be free will. And so Adam listened to the woman who listened to the serpent in contradiction to the words of God through her husband, she had to tell him. I mean, he told her, but she said to herself, what does he know? That talking snake knows better. And isn't that the case? We go on YouTube and we get all kinds of messages and, and, and theories and, and we think them as gospel. We think that they're gospel. So if you don't have the the ability or the discernment to decide what is truth and what is error, you will be in trouble. And so in contradiction to the word of God through her husband, the serpent told her to touch, then taste. That's how it works. It's a, it's a gradual moving towards uh, sin. You see, our culture and the media is telling us today that certain practices and behaviors are fine. In this modern era, what we thought was settled is no longer settled. As we saw in the Sabbath school, I remember one of my, uh, my churches, one of the elders, when I, I said that uh, Michael was Jesus, yeah, he, he tore a piece off of me. So it's good that we have Sabbath school, that we can listen and learn and grow. So Satan's plot in contradiction to God's plan is what we have today. Husbands listening to their wives without following God's instructions produce the same outcomes. It has been downhill ever since and will continue until Jesus returns. Only the second advent will stop this downhill slide into confusion and conflict. So I'm gonna to talk to us about the conflict. It's here, we are living it. You see, when ancient Israel wanted a king or worshiped idols or sacrificed their children, they didn't get this, these practices out of thin air. They got them on loan from their neighbors. And the Lord had warned Moses in Deuteronomy 31, 16 through 19. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy 31, 16 through 19. Deuteronomy 31, 16 through 19. Here's, here's the warning of the Lord to Moses and hence to us. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. And this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whether they go to be among them. And will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Verse 17 then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my what? My face. Wow, you're in trouble when God, uh, you can't look in God's face. He's hiding his face from them, and they shall be what? That's a terrible word, is it not? And many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? Verse 18, and I will surely hide my face. He emphasizes it again. He's surely hiding his face in that day from all the evils which they shall have wrought and in that they are turned unto other 
small G-O-D-S. So the gods in our lives, we turn away from the big G, as Sister Co uh, Sherry Colby always says, the big G God. Verse 19 says, now therefore write ye this song. Here, here's, here's the instructive part of this, this text. Write ye this song for you and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Did you know that Deuteronomy 32 was a song? I, 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 the Holy Spirit showed it to me this week and I said, wow. Read it all through so many times and didn't pay it any mind. But here it is. But I'm not gonna read it because I don't wanna have you here uh, a long time. Deuteronomy 32, when you go home, verses one through 43 is that song. You see, singing is a great tool in aiding children to learn. When we had our little three kids and we were teaching them, my wife uh, would, would sing. Uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's how they learn their alphabet. Did any other parent do that or is it just us? All right, all right. Yeah, because it fixes it in their minds. And when we sing songs, when we sing scripture, a lot of scriptures are put to song. That's why you have in Psalm, all of those are songs or hymns that were put to music and it's able to be retained in the memory. And so <clears throat> it's easier than to remember. It's the song that God instructed Moses to write. I think this might be uh, in Deuteronomy here, this might be the first hymn in the Bible. And it was written by Moses and they had to memorize it. You see, in, uh, Israel ultimately justified attitudes and behavior that were antithetical or opposed or incompatible with the instructions given by God through his divinely selected leaders. And so in this song, God was telling them what's gonna happen to them. And so when we look at the early Christian church, yeah, let's leave them behind. We know their story. We studied it last quarter. We studied Deuteronomy and we know what befell them. We know how they provoked Moses that he could not go in the promised land and God had to bury him. Satan wanted him, but God blessed him that he was able to take him, resurrect him and send him to heaven. So all of his troubles, 40 years with hard-headed people, you try being a leader and see how easy it is because you got different personalities you got to deal with. And so if you're not connected to the Lord, guess what? You're going to be in trouble. So when we look at the early Christian church, where did the idea of the immortal soul come from? It's not in scripture. They didn't get it out of the word. It was absorbed from their pagan neighbors, brothers and sisters, and from the surrounding culture, which flooded into their life. The same thing is happening to the church. Can you see it? How did Sunday worship arise? Not from scripture, not from believers' fertile imagination. They borrowed it from their sun worshiping pagan neighbors, friends that influence your life. You can't be friendly to everybody. Don't invite everybody into your inner circle. Be careful. The church of the medieval era worshiped images and relics. It developed the teaching of transubstantiation. You know what that word means? Yeah, it's a long word, transubstantiation, which is the conversion of the, the substance of the Eucharist, the elements in the body and, uh, which that we uh, broke. Well, we, we stopped breaking it now. We get it in a cup and we get it uh, all packaged. But normally we have the, the, the biscuit or the unleavened bread and we break it and we pour the wine, the unfermented wine. But in some churches, the, the priest gets to drink it all. So that's what they call transubstantiation. So when he holds the host up and he prays over it and he blesses the wine, he holds them up, both of them, they change from bread or biscuit and juice to what? The body, the literal body and blood of Jesus. That's the word, transubstantiation. How did they get that? They didn't get it from the word. 
And so the emblems only had the appearance of bread, they say, and wine. They literally become the flesh and literally the blood of Jesus. And so praying and talking to dead people, where do they get that from? It's the result of Christians borrowing ideas and practices that originated in non-Christian faith. These are the words that I read yesterday in Virginia on a vehicle. I was parked, I was stopped at the traffic light and I saw this, this vehicle and as I pulled right up close to the bumper so I could see it. I took my camera out and I snapped this picture. And these are the words. All I want is for mom and dad in heaven to know how much I love and miss them. That was a sermon illustration I couldn't let go by. You see, I, I, I walk around with my eyes wide open, Elder Rob, because I want to hear and see. So a sermon isn't made on Friday night. It's brewing all week and sometimes way before because I'm always in I'm always thinking about the word and, and finding what God is trying to say through his Holy Spirit. So here, this dear lady <clears throat> wants her mom and dad who is in heaven to know how much I love and miss them. I'm sure it's just the Kobe's uh, uh, parents uh, at their funeral, whenever it happens, they won't be sending uh, Sister Butler into heaven because they have read the word. And they understand what the spirit of prophecy says. You know, we're blessed, Ron, because uh, Elder Harvey read something that you you had read, and you sometimes we don't recall, like Elder Johnson. He's got a photographic memory. He just looks at the page and he snaps his eyes and he remembers everything. And he comes back and he tells you chapter and verse. But mortals like us, uh, we have to read it again and again and again. Sometimes I'm reading and I'm. Uh, you, your mind will drift and you got to hold it and come back and say, let me read it again. Sometimes I got to read it three times to get it. And so in, in modern Protestantism, we haven't done much better. Christians became good Nazis in the Third Reich. The former German state, the Nazi regime from 1933 to 1945, that's the Third Reich. The German Christians. These are Christians now. They said that Jesus was not a Jew. They saw him as an anti-Semite. You know, the Semitic languages, the Arabs speak that too. <clears throat> uh, because they're, they're, they're children of Abraham. Did you know that? They're, they're siblings. But they don't like each other for some reason. And so before the Germanic Christians were, were they, they, they thought through with, with the, uh, the Nazarene rabbi, after they were finished with him, he was not a Jew anymore. He was a goose-stepping, strudel-eating son of the Third Reich. And here's the result of such mindset. This is what happens when we have the wrong mindset. It's estimated that between 10 million military were killed, 7, point, 7 million uh, civilian died, 21 million wounded, and 7.7 .7 million missing or imprisoned. And over 60 million people died in World War II. 38 to 30, 55 million civilians were killed, including 13 to 20 million from war-related diseases and famine. You, you think you're gonna be hungry because you go into mark, supermarkets, the shelves are empty now. People are worried sick. The, 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 um, the supply lines are cut, people are sick, they can't go to work, the hospitals, the, the nurses and doctors are sick, they tell them you gotta come in after five days, whether you have COVID or not, because we are short. And so people are panicked, you go in the stores, it's picked clean. So here's what happened in that war where millions of people, up to 80 million, if you include famines related to the war, almost 30 million of them were Soviets. Soviet Union suffered the greatest in these wars. That's almost 20% of the population at that time. Imagine that if we lost 20% of our population. We are panicked. War was worse than the current COVID experience. You know how many millions of people have been, well, this is what they say, 
they're reported, but not everybody says it, that they have COVID or reported. 320 million people so far worldwide have had COVID. That's what has been reported. They know how many died because they get a death certificate of whether you die in the, home, the hospital or you die at home, you have to get a death certificate. So they, they're saying 5.5 million have died of COVID in the last two years. That's 1.7%. 1.7% of those who had COVID died according to these statistics. Can you imagine a, a war originating from Germany who were so-called so Christians and 60 to 80 million people were killed in those wars? It's unbelievable. I'm trying to show us where the conflict comes from. That's the, the title of my message. The conflict is here. Where did Southern Christians derive Jim Crow and cross burning from? Well, they were pulled continuously by a racist culture that looked at the word of God, denied the full humanity of all persons proclaimed in the Bible. They ultimately justified attitudes and behaviors antithetical to the teachings of Jesus. They used the Bible. Where did apartheid come from? These were Christians in South Africa using the word of God because they didn't have the benefit or listen to the spirit of prophecy as we had today to hear clarity coming from Elder Harvey about a, a subject that we struggle with or we may have questions about. And so Jim Crow institutionalized economic, educational and social disadvantages and second class citizenship for our African ancestors living here in the United States. And we're still struggling. We're still starting. This little pin here says, build a dream. I remember when they had a challenge. It was never done ever before to build a monument to a, a civil rights icon like Martin Luther King. They never did it before. You look on all the, uh, the monuments in Washington, DC. They're all from the bygone era, the 19th century. They're coming to reckon with some of the leaders of our nations who held slaves and they were Christians. They had the Bible that they could read, but they read it with sort of adjustable, adjusted lens instead of letting the spirit speak. How about some Christians today? I'm coming closer to home. It's hard to find anything more anti-biblical than, than the assertion that billions of years of evolution were required as God's way of creating life on earth. John 1, turn with me to John 1 verse 4. You'll see right there. Love to hear those pages turning. I know we have it on our devices, but I carry the word as well into the pulpit. John, St. John 1, verses 1. In the beginning, this is, a, this is a repeat of Genesis, you know that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So if you have con uh, uh, issues with uh, where, where, where Jesus came from, did he just start when Mary pushed him out? Uh-uh. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that had been made. Hallelujah. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Praise God. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness had not understood it. So God is trying to give light to all of history, showing us every era where we, we have problems. All of those that I've enumerated, even up to our time, where people are saying they use the word science. Uh, that's the closest thing to a God in the modern world. 
Some have accepted theistic evolution in place of biblical creation. These are Christians. So it's not new saints. This is an ongoing problem for, for generation because we pass on the baton to our children, all of the habits and the practices that we normalize, we pass it on to our children. Here again, culture prevails. In the end, these, uh, those who won't worship the image of the beast will be persecuted and some will even be martyred, Revelation 13, 15. How quickly and easily then, when death is threatened, will we accept the mark of the beast on the forehead or in the hand, Revelation 14, verse nine? Easy, because we don't like to be hungry. We won't wanna lose our jobs. And so we're gonna, this is a preparation, saints, for that. We are being softened up. Based on scripture, God's remnant church is mired in a conflict. And so the question we have to ask ourselves personally is whose side am I leaning on? I'm leaning on the Lord's side. Can you say that? Yes. Don't you switch sides depending on the circumstances. The conflict plays out in our homes, in our churches, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our state, and in our world. We are a conflicted people. There's a war going on in our minds. Let's give the trumpet a clear sound and not confuse ourselves and, uh, and others. There are all types of erroneous beliefs in the Christian world today. We have our heavenly GPS, hallelujah. Let's follow it. It's not gonna say recalculating, recalculating when we take a detour, when we put the word down and the spirit of prophecy, we're gonna get ourselves in mess. Three angels message. We studied it for the last 10 days. John 16, verse 13. Here's what it says, John 16, 13. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will do what? Guide you into all truths. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Hallelujah. So we don't need to have a, have a, have a crystal ball. We don't have to go to the, uh, the, down the street on the highway when I come by in Easton. There's a, there's a thriving business going on. Somebody reading your future. And you pay the money, foolishness. Isaiah 8.20 tells us to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Don't follow that route. Don't do it. We've all been impacted by this deadly COVID pandemic. Yes, we're all feeling it. Families, marriages are busting up. People are killing themselves. This is what the result is when you don't have Jesus and you're not worshiping and praying together. The devil will turn you into an idiot. Go back to the word. We are expecting this. This must come, a time of trouble. Now, and so we know something unusual is happening. We're in the time of change. And the final movements, as the Lord through his servant says, in last day events, page 12, the final movements will be rapid ones. We must go with the three angels message under the Holy Spirit's power. Let's keep our eyes on the prize saints. Don't allow strange voices to confuse us. And sometimes we read something and we don't understand it. Don't run off and draw conclusions. Check with each other. That's why we have each other, amen? That's why we have Sabbath school. We learn in Sabbath school. First Timothy chapter six, three through five. Let's, let's uh, turn there. First Timothy chapter six, three through five. And so we, we know the word of God and what it says, and we've got to learn it. We've got to put it in our memory. And when we don't have the word, we're going to have to call on Elder Johnson to remind us. He'll tell us. It says here, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is what? Proud, knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, 
strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wrangling of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, what does the word say? You can't be friends with everybody else. Not going to happen because they're going to try to bend your brain. And you can't watch everything. You can't be spending time listening to all these preachers on YouTube. It's not going to help you. It's confusing. It will confuse you. Word says, turn away. Withdraw yourself. We have solid biblical foundation to proclaim to the world. Revelation 3, verse 11. What does it say? Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no man take your crown. 2 Peter 1, 16. Mark it. Write it down if you can't turn to it. I don't want to keep you long, so I'm not going to wait till you find it. Write it down. Check it out later. We did not follow cunningly devised fables <clears throat> when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 19. We have the prophetic word. Hallelujah. Confirmed. Verse 20, no prophecy of uh, no prophecy of scriptures of any private interpretation. Verse 21, prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. So God used people and he used human language to get across truth to us. So sometimes it's a little confusing. Uh, Brother Dorsey on our Sabbath school this morning, he's wondering uh, about, you know, the different titles of Jesus and so on and so forth. That's human language. The thing is too much. When I think about it, my, I have to stop because I can't figure out. I can't figure out God. Canst thou by searching find out God? Hey, it's like having a, getting a scroll, a scroll. I see the scrolls every morning. They they're running around, especially when the snow was was uh, on the ground. They're looking for whatever nuts they hid. Can you imagine the, the, the scrolls using computers and iPhones? That's what we have, a scroll's brain compared to God. There are hundreds of millions who do not believe what we just read. Prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They've never seen the Holy Spirit. They've never seen angels. And so they can't figure it out. And so because their little pea brain can't figure it out or wrap their mind around it, they say it doesn't, it's not existing. If we can't see it, feel it, touch it, or taste it, that's our limited five senses, right? We, we can't see beyond the veil. We can't see the angels, ministering angels ministering to us. I know that my guardian angel was with us when we drove through Delaware the other day. And I'm passing this vehicle, and the vehicle cut in front of me. One time is a mistake. But when they do it twice, my wife says, back off, back off. You know how we are aggressive? We want to we wanna pass, and we want to, you know, I, I don't give them the finger because I'm converted, but you give them the eye. Amen? And so she said, back off, back off. And I saw the car slowed down. It's a big old SUV. We got this little, little Prius car. And we all packed up, ready to go to our daughters. And this big old car trying to swipe us, side swipe us. You know, they speed up and they try to, for you to run in them as, as you pass it. And I waited and I waited. And you know, your blood and your heart is, is pumping and, and you want to do what comes natural. But thank God for a godly wife who says, slow down, wait, let him go. And they did, they passed. And they turn. That was it. We made it. But that's the devil working in somebody. Have you ever been on the beltway? Every time we go on the beltway, we see crazy people. They're under the influence of something, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's a ugly spirit because those, those guys are weaving back and forth. And they're going, I, the cops couldn't even chase them if they tried. They used to do them on, on bikes. And they, they pop the wheel up you know, right on one wheel. And these little kids, man, going crazy. So, so we're in a tough time. <clears throat> now, these critics who, who examine the Bible, they follow the historical critical method 
or higher criticism approach, placing their own private interpretation on what the Bible says. We as Seventh-day Adventists believe in the historical, biblical, or historical grammatical approach, allowing the Bible to interpret itself. Isaiah 28, 13, but the word of the Lord was unto them, what? Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and where? There a little, because the Bible is a unit, it's a whole. Isaiah 28, 15 says, because you have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through? It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. So these higher critics and these, uh, uh, when you look at the Bible and they criticize it and tear it apart and say it's not true, they have made what? They have made, uh, they have taken refuge in lies and under falsehood have they hid themselves. We believe in the historical approach to prophecy. The belief that historical events are governed by laws, not the precept, uh, not the preterist, that's the word, preterist or the futurist approach. Preterist means it happened all in the past. The futurists are saying it's in the future. And so they, they, they throw away prophecy. The historical biblical hermeneutical approach is the correct method. Theories other than God's approach method, approved method will lead to ruin and confusion and lays the foundation for acceptance of the mark of the beast and syncretism. You know what that is? Synchristic approach is accepting truth with error, mixing truth and error. And so the amalgamation of different religious uh, beliefs on cultures or schools of thought, interfaith dialogue can easily slip into syncretism. Yeah, we want to do good with those who are doing good. And so we sort of get used to being with them. We go to church on Sunday as well as Sabbath. And we hear a little bad wine and we mix it with what we hear on Sabbath. And they got the music over there. They got you hopping. Amen. And so they're having church up in there. And so we think that's the way to go. Feed the emotions and forget the thoughts and the thinking. So we have a sure word of prophecy. We have the prophetic word confirmed. The pillars of God's church are founded on God's word. Not what I think or what the next preacher thinks. His word is solid, sure, and salvific, leading to salvation. There are some faith-destroying theological ab aberrations connected with Babylon, confusion, and Satan himself that we need to avoid. And so our mission is to preach and live. Because, hey, it's one thing to preach, brothers and sisters. We can preach a good sermon, give a nice Bible study. But how are we living? If it hasn't affected you in your home with your, your family, you're wasting your time. Wasting your time. We've got to preach and live Christ and him crucified. Righteousness by faith, not works. Busy, busy, busy in the church, doing all kinds of things. And, and you can't stand each other. The three angels message and is soon coming. That's what we're about. We should expect that we are seeing it. This is the time of shaking, brothers and sisters. Here's what Sister White says in last day events, page 173. She says, we're in the time of shaking, or the, she says the shaking time, the time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken, not if must, it will. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey his commands. And so here are a few errors that are taught, which misrepresents God and his word. Number one, the word of God is not accepted as authoritative. Don't worry about the words in scripture, just get the principles. This is a disastrous delusion when we do that. This concept is produced by the father of all lies, Satan himself. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we should memorize that. How many scriptures? Not just the New Testament saints. The 
old and the new. If you throw out, if you tear the Bible in half, and you got, you've lost more than half, so probably two thirds. And then you just take the New Testament and you only preach out of there. You're in trouble. You gotta have the foundation for the building. It's not gonna go anywhere. <clears throat> you're gonna be on sinking sand. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And even the pieces of scripture that you don't understand. If you don't understand it, don't be so arrogant to think that it's wrong because you don't understand it. It's because we got a pre-brain and we need the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Yeah, we, gotta, we need reproof. Sermons are designed by nature to fix what's broken in us. I'm not going to pat your head and rub your tummy like some preachers do and make you feel good. I want us to get it so that when the Lord asks me the, res uh, the response, what did you do to the flock that I gave you? I can say, well, here are the sermons, Lord. This is my 84th sermon to Pisgah. And we're still not fixed. So I may have another 84 to go before we all get it because we are in a growth process. We're not all at the same stage, saints. And so when we, when we see folk acting like infants, then we, yeah, they're infants. But when we see adults who should be uh, eating solid food, drinking milk, then we know we're in trouble. We're not making progress, amen? And so it's, it's for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness that the man of God, and it includes women, they use that word, term, but if the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every, what? Yeah, good work. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, for I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God would add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of the prophecy, God will take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Clearly, the word of God is absolutely essential for my survival and for your survival. Amen. And especially in these difficult days, because we don't know what is coming next. The government keeps making plans and, and they think it's going to fix the economy. All they're interested in now is that people work. That's it. They want to fix the economy. They don't care about you. Fix the economy. Let's all get back, whether you got COVID or not. Let's get back to work because that's how the politicians are. Uh, that's their um, measuring stick. How is the economy growing? What's the GDP? Uh, how are business? What's the profit? The bottom line, they're not, they're not teaching you what we're teaching. We are necessary. So when they lock the church and they open the liquor bar, that's what they're telling you. Go buy liquor. If you feel sad, drink yourself and go to bed. Take drugs. And so the church must take a stand. When we see wrong, we got to say something. We believe in thought inspiration, not in verbal inspiration. So when you see something that you don't understand, a, a word that, that uses human language, remember that, that you know, we, we can't understand heavenly language. So we must be humble and say, well, I, I, I don't understand that yet. Sometimes I talk to my wife, uh, um, there are some things I can't understand. So I have to quit thinking. And be humble enough to say, well, this brain is not made to go that far. And back up. Don't keep pushing and arguing and fighting and fussing. No, leave it alone. If you don't understand it yet, pray for the Holy Spirit to help you. God allows the prophets to use words portraying God's messages. Do not try to change them or speculate using your own private in interpretation. There are those who question the reliability of the Bible, the word of God. They add uh, non-canonical, apocalyptic, apocryphal, apocryphal books. I have one of those Bibles on my shelf, and I was going to bring it and show you. They have Maccabees and all that. They say, you don't have the full Bible uh, because all you got is the Old Testament, but you need to bring these non-canonical book to speak. And there's a church who does that. And when they add it to, the, to scripture, they get all of this, all of this praying to saints and all that foolishness. 
and you need to avoid it. Reject this synchristic um, um, view, mixing culture and humanistic thinking into the word of God. God's truth is anchored in his revelations and we have a sure word of prophecy. You see, the spirit of prophecy indicates that we should read the Bible as it reads. Christ triumphant, page 226. Here's what she said. We're so blessed. We have sermon material at the cliff that the other folks don't have. We have references. I got a whole, I got about a thousand books on my, this little thing here. I don't even go to them because they're written by men. This is from heaven. Here's what the servant of God says. Christ triumphant, page 226. The most learned men in the days of Christ, philosophers, legislators, priests, in all their pride and superiority, could not interpret God's character. The earth was languishing for a teacher sent from God. But when he came, just as the living oracles specified, he would come. The priests and instructors of the people could not discern that he was their savior, nor could they understand the manner of his coming. Unaccustomed to accepting God's word exactly as it reads, or to allow it to be its own interpreter, they read it in the light of their maxims and traditions. Does it, you want it any plainer than that? So long had they neglected to study and contemplate the Bible that its pages were to them a mystery. They turned with aversion from the truth of God to the tradition of men. That's what all these churches are doing, throwing the word of God out and these smart preachers with their, their way of putting words and their mesmerizing the congregation with the, the charismatic style. I'm just telling you like it is, plain as I know. So th that's one thing, they throw the word out. They attempt, this is the second attempt, and this is more so in our church, they diminish the spirit of prophecy. I'm so happy to see a young man who was steeped in the spirit of prophecy and is not trying to uh, get rid of it. You know, some preachers don't even quote from the spirit of prophecy. You don't want to listen to that because all their words and what they borrowed from the, from the writings. I got these books on my iPad, all these smart people who wrote. Josephus and all that. They quote you all of those quotes from different writers, but they are loath to, to give a quote from the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White predicted there would be an attempt to dis destroy God's work through her. Testimonies to ministers, page 51. Here's, and this is a lot of preachers that are doing this. Here's what she says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 51. The result of such work will be unbelief in the testimonies as far as possible. They will make of none effect. We do this by ignoring the spirit of prophecy, challenging it, or contradicting it. The spirit of prophecy was given by God through Ellen G. White as a special instruction to God's last day remnant church. And we have insights that others do not. I'm telling you what Elder Harvey read this morning was just profound, full stop. And so when I heard him read it, I said, Ron, the, the, you know, this woman is, she couldn't have wrote, written that. What was that third grade education she had? Yeah, couldn't, couldn't have written that. God spoke to her. So Revelation 12, 17 says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman. Who's the woman? The church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so the spirit of prophecy is reliable and it is to be believed and accepted in its entirety, including strong messages from God about apocalyptic prophecy and instructions that are for our time, for all time. As we read the spirit of prophecy, we are con uh, convinced of its accuracy. When I heard that this morning, I had to say, thank you, Jesus. It's a, it's a gift to us. When we throw our gift, the gift away, we're in trouble. The, here's another uh, area that causes us to be drifting. It's good drifting in a car, but uh, you know, not drifting in the church. 
Justification and sanctification. That's another area. We're talking about Christ's righteousness. It encompasses this justifying and this sanctifying power. And it's at the core of the three angels' messages. It is through Christ's justification that we can be righteous in the Father's eyes. It is through Christ's sanctification that we can keep the command. You can't keep it. Can't keep it. You try to drive 55 down the, fee the freeway here. You can't do it. You're going you to go over it one time. But thank God they give us a, a, a grace five, five miles over. Is that what it is? Huh? That's okay? Five over? No over. Okay, okay. I've been, I've been settling in on, at five over. So when I go to the Eastern Shore, I put it on 63 and I put the cruise on and they never bother me. So, so that, they give you grace, don't they? So here it is, here it is, here it is. Keep the commandments of God, you can't do it. You can't do right in your own self. Revelation 14 tells us, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So Jesus isn't waiting for you as you go five miles over to zap you. No, not at all. Jesus didn't have any cars back then. He rode a donkey. Amen? Man-made laws here. And so this indicates that God's people at the end of time will be keeping God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Righteousness through justification and sanctification is ours. Amen? So don't go around looking for, um, you know, trying to work up yourself and say, look, look, checking off all the things that you do. Here's what Sister White says in Steps to Christ, page 62. We have no righteousness of our own. Did you hear that? We have no righteousness of our own which, which, with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to, to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. Hallelujah. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. So long as you do this, hallelujah, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So yes, we have inborn traits and tendencies that we picked up from our parents and things that we picked up on our own and we're struggling with habits. We've got to fall at the feet of Jesus and ask him to take away those sins that are inborn in us. We do it without thought and he will, he'll give you the victory. Then with Christ working in you, she says, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness and obedience. So we have nothing in ourselves uh, of which to boast. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by his spirit working in and through us. So all we get, all, all the good that you do, don't be going around you know, with your nose up in the air, hey, look how good I am. You can't do it by yourself. The moment you take your eyes off Jesus, you fall. There's another sign that tells us that we are at the very end. Number four is denial of the urgency of the times. Some do not understand the urgency, believing they cannot do anything about the return of Christ. Yes, here's what 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12 says. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening? That's the word I'm looking for. Hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so when we all push in the same direction as a congregation, we can hasten Christ's coming. We should not predict when Jesus will come. We're not going to do what our ancestors did. We're not going to set a date. We're going to keep pushing in the right direction. That is sharing the good news, sharing the three angels' message. And so however in the scripture, God has provided enough signs. We know we have a sign right here. The, 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 the mandate that everybody takes the vaccine. And the Supreme Court saved us a little space. Just a little space. They're going to mandate that you work on Sabbath 
and go to church on Sunday. Here is the next one. Humanism or heavenly inspiration. Humanism is in, in our culture as obscured the understanding that supernatural inspiration is overwhelmingly more powerful than any humanistic philosophy. Put a priority on the power of God and his word in guiding us in all things and reject humanism. In Matthew 15, eight and nine, uh, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips. We can sing a good song, but their hearts is far from me. But in vain, he says, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines. Yes, you got it, what man says. Number six, ignoring, this is another sign for us, ignoring the sanctuary service and the gospel message. This was a big thing back in the 70s. A lot of theology students got themselves messed up because they were following a man that is now dead, saying there's no sanctuary in heaven. And we, the church went through a tough time. And a lot of them uh, followed, you know, don't follow any charismatic preacher that's telling you something that's not biblical. Don't do it. You're going to be in trouble. The sanctuary and its services point to the gospel, the lamb slain on the cross. Here's what Sister White says in Last Day Events, page 177. The enemy will bring in false theories, such as the doctrine that there is no sanctuary. This is one of the points on which there will be a departing from the faith. And they left us in droves. Yes, they did. Daniel 8, 14, they don't care about what it says. They say, don't believe these words. There was only 2,300 literal days and the time of the end, Antiochus Epiphanes, that's how long it went. So if you throw out the 2,300 day prophecy of Daniel 8, 14, you might as well shut doors, shut up shop, and go join the there's a Baptist church down here. What's this little church down here? We'll fill it up in a heartbeat. Yeah. And so we use the biblical day year principle given to interpret prophecy. We allow the Bible to interpret itself. The, the historist approach shows us that history has accurately unfolded according to the word of God. And then my final point, ecumenism versus the shaking and sifting of God's church. Be wary of ecumenism. Focus on the proclamation of the three angels' message. Believe that the great controversy says about the end time setting when the shaking and the sifting of the church will take place. We are to make friends with people, but we are never to compromise and engage in religious ecumenical activity. Some of our pastors, they like to go to other people's church and preach and they go Sunday and they go Sabbath. Some of them keep church on Sunday morning and Sabbath morning. Confuse the people. And, and they have Friday. Ecumenism. That's that, oh, thank you for clarification. It's when, when the, the churches come together, ecumenical movement, that's the word. And so everybody, we all Christians, let's all get together and. And if we don't worry about our distinctives, let's throw it out and let's come together and agree on, on one thing. Uh, Jesus is the Lord and he save us. And, they, and they, they just throw out the Old Testament and they just use the gospels, the life of Christ. That's all you need. Here's the time will come when we will face op, uh, 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 oppression. We must not compromise our beliefs and doctrines. Page 180 of Sister White's last event, she says, Soon God's people will be tested by fiery trials. And the great proportion of those who now appear to be genuine and true will prove to be what? Base metal. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. Don't worry about how many people come to church. You can have a Holy Ghost time here with just a few of us here. Amen. Just the team on the, on the platform. and, and the, uh, We can have a Holy Ghost time here. You're sitting up there in your house. You can't have a Holy Ghost time up there. This is God's house. His name is on it. Let's, let's give him back his church. Amen. This is his church. Hands off, government. <laughs> it remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The, the church is going to be here until Jesus comes. And the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must 
take place. And saints, members of Pisgah, the conflict is here. It's being played out within each of us individually, in our homes, in our churches, in our communities, and among nations, and in our entire world. During the 10 days, we, we heard some powerful uh, messages. But the one that resonated with me was the one that Elder Harvey, uh, he did both. He presented the reading, and he was the facilitator. And he quoted on the reading that Elder, Elder um, What's his name? On Thursday, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan read on Thursday, and he read this. And I, this is what I take away from uh, the 10 days of reading. The beast within us, that's a subtitle. This message of the third angel speaks of a time that is coming when church and state will unite on the authority of the papacy. You know who the papacy is. Don't be afraid to say it, the Roman Catholic Church. Somebody caught the Pope going into some record store. They, they filmed him this week out in Rome because he doesn't go anywhere in a motorcade. He just hops in his little Jeep and he goes and he, he acts very obscure. And he, he's a good man, not, but the system that he's a part of, that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the system. It's been here for a long time and has been, been causing a lot of problems around the world. The final message of the three angel is a call to earnest heartfelt prayer. The antichrist principle of pride rather than humility, self-exaltation rather than self-sacrifice for the good of others and trust in human wisdom rather than the divine inspiration of the scripture is deeply ingrained in our fallen natures. What is the solution to the principle of the beast dwelling in me? We always push it out there. Hey, not us. We all don't have the beast in me. Identify what it is. When we pray, don't pray this us prayer. Pray me prayers. We learned some things about praying this week, did we not? I, I thank Sister Annette for facilitating. Uh, and I thank all of you who facilitated in teaching us how to stop listing our, our shopping list. And just pray from the heart. Pray as the Lord inspires us. So, so this, this is it. That's the solution to the principles of the beast dwelling in us. There's only one solution, that is Jesus. His grace, his power, his loving, his love for fill, filling our hearts and lives, unless our commitment to him is stronger than the pull of the world. Did you hear me? Our commitment to him must be stronger than the pull of the world. Our jobs, our houses, our, our whatever material things that is holding us down. We will be dominated by the principles of the beast today and will one day accept the beast mark. It's in the mind, we can't see it. It's not a tattoo, it's not, the, the, it's not being vaxxed. It's the mind that is saying, I'm settling down here. I am not planning to go anywhere. I wanna build my little kingdom here on earth. That's the mark. And then when we can't buy or sell, then that's the mark in the hand. Can't go to the supermarket. They say you can't go to the, uh, to the restaurants unless you're fully vaxxed and you gotta show your card. But thank God, he's given us a little time. There's a little window that we gotta move and position ourselves, saints. The warning against the mark of the beast and the third angel's message should drive us to our knees in humble submission to Christ, pleading for his spirit to purge us thoroughly from within and work the miracle of divine grace in our hearts. It should also lead us to pray for our families, our friends, our neighbors, that they do not have the heart open to Christ's saving last day message. The message should motivate us to look forward to the day when we will rejoice with Christ around his throne forever. Hallelujah. So let us live the faith daily. Not just on Sabbath when we've got our suits and our nice dresses on. Here's, here's what I'm, I'm going to finish with this quote. This is very important. I left it for the last. The servant of the Lord says, true piety begins when all compromises with sin is, set, is at an end. You want me to repeat that? 
Let's say it slowly. True piety begins when all compromises with sin is set aside or is at an end. When the soul has surrendered itself to do the will of God, there is no feeling of self-security. And if we live under the guidance of the Spirit of God day by day and hour by hour, we shall not fail nor be discouraged. We got to stop compromising with ourselves. I don't see nothing wrong with that. I can eat that. I can watch that. I can go there. I can go here. I don't see nothing wrong with it. Sure, you don't see nothing wrong with it because your eyes are blind. From, from, and this nation, these are all Christians. All the things that I shared with you that happened in our world, these are all Christian people who took the word and they used it to accomplish their purpose. Brothers and sisters, when prayer is our habit, miracles become our lifestyle. 